Hi, everybody. We're just inviting you all in from the waiting room and uh, just letting uh, you come into this space and, uh, and we'll get underway in a minute. Colleen, why hey. don't you get us underway? Good morning, everyone. My name is Colleen Lindholm and I am part of the community development and engagement team at RPAP. Our team can be found across the province working with rural communities in the realm of attraction and retention of healthcare providers. I am hosting today's workshop from Camrose in central Alberta. So before we get going with today's session, I thought I would come on with just a little bit of housekeeping and information. As you likely have noticed, we have videos and sound off on participants just as an attempt to save on a bit of bandwidth. We know that there are some people out there that may have some connectivity issues, and we are hopeful that this will help. If you do have questions, please be sure to put them into the chat, and we will do our best to watch for those and ensure that our presenter is able to answer them. We are recording this session today, and that should be available for viewing once we've had an opportunity to have a look and ensure that it's the quality is suitable enough to share out. So, um, Connor, if we can put the poll up, we do have people joining us from all over Alberta today, and we are curious to know a little bit more about all of you. And um, so we've developed this quick poll just to learn who's in attendance before we can get going. So if everyone can just take a second and look on their screen and select the answer that best fits them, that would be appreciated. And we can just leave that up for a couple more seconds. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. We have a really good diversified uh, group of folks here with us today. So um, thank you everyone for participating in that poll. So today we are so thrilled to be bringing you this special edition of Fall Workshop Series, of which we have partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Association and the Tamarack Institute. So before we dig into our why with Liz from Tamarack, we do have Tim Neubauer bringing greetings from the Canadian Mental Health Association. So over to you, Tim, for a few words. Thanks, Colleen. And good morning, everyone. Um, happy fall to everyone. Probably that's not maybe good news for some, but it is the first day of fall. Uh, so my name is Tim Neubauer. I'm with the Canadian Mental Health Association here in Alberta. And we are excited. Uh, this is hopefully one of many opportunities in the future for us to partner with, with other networks. And so some of my colleagues are also uh, here today on the webinar um, and we're part of the Rural Mental Health Network here in Alberta. And so it's exciting to work with not only RPAP but also TAMRAC because I think as we're beginning to see there's quite a, an overlap in, in the work that we're doing in communities just all across Canada. So um, we're excited, we want you to learn more about us. And so if you get a chance after the webinar, if you wanna just go to Rural Mental Health dot ca uh, you'll be able to see more about what we're doing uh, about our learn more about our network and also there's a lot of great um, other training opportunities that are available so please feel free to um, to go and, and check that out afterwards so i'm excited uh, as well to be here today and looking to learn some some great things so again welcome everyone Awesome. Thanks so much, Tim. We are so pleased to be working with you guys and offering this series of workshops. So I will now turn it over to Liz Weaver from the Tamarack Institute. Liz is the co-CEO of Tamarack Institute, where she is leading the Tamarack Learning Center. We are so pleased to have her facilitating this session for us today. Looking forward to learning lots from you today, Liz, and over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Colleen, and uh, thanks, Tim. It's really exciting to be working with both of you guys uh, on this workshop series. I know this is the first in a fall uh, series of workshops, so if you haven't registered for the other one, we certainly do encourage you to, and we'll send you out some more information about that. Just want to begin this workshop by acknowledging that each of us is joining and meeting on Indigenous land. And as settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet and we thank the generations of Indigenous people who've taken care of this land. It really, by acknowledging um, the land that we're meeting on, it really is um, bringing to life our commitment to the process of truth and reconciliation. And I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Erie Neutral, Huron-Wendat, 
Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. And this land is also known as um, the land of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which is about the care and the stewardship of the lands around the Great Lakes. And so I'm joining you from Hamilton, Ontario, but the traditional territories um, of, that, uh, of that wampum belt covenant. Um, so let's get on with the content today. So today, what we hope to do when, in this workshop around discovering your why or uncovering your why, we hope that you will learn something new, that it might also enhance something that you already know, or you might be able to see something from a new angle. These are our best hopes for this session today. Um, in the chat box, we're going to go back and forth to the chat box a, a number of times. So we invite you to kind of note in the chat box, introduce yourselves to each other, but also what brought you to this session today? And also what, uh, you know, when you looked at the topic, what were you hoping to learn? And so um, for those of you that know how to navigate your way into the chat box, we invite you to do, to just um, have a bit of a conversation through the chat box with one another. So we're going to talk uh, in three parts today. We're going to talk about understanding our why from a personal perspective. Then we're going to talk about understanding our why from an organizational perspective. And then finally, we're going to look at what does this mean for us as leaders and as change makers. And so those are the three things that we're um, going to explore together uh, during this workshop. And the first one, I don't know if any of you have read this book by uh, Simon Sinek, but he has uh, talked about uncovering your why or discovering your why. And in the book, he talks about this kind of golden circle. And there are three elements to the golden circle that he talks about. The first is clarity of the why. So what is your purpose, your cause, or your belief? And uh, so often we start at the outer circle, the what are we doing, as opposed to the why are we doing it? What are those things? Why? What are those things that are calling our purpose, that are calling our cause, that are calling our belief? The second circle is the discipline of the how, your strengths, your values, your guiding principles. And then the consistency of the what. So are we working consistently with our why, our how, and our what? And so I find it to be kind of a, a great way of grounding us. And we're going to spend a bit of time in those first two circles, the why and the how, because you're doing a lot already in your what. Um, so, so we want to think about the two um, a little bit more deeply. So the personal why is really composed of these kinds of things. It's part of our values. It highlights what we stand for. Our whys can represent us as unique and they're part of our kind of individual essence. And when our whys come together, when our unique whys come together, we feel really purposeful and really connected together. They guide our behaviors, values guide our behaviors. And they're our personal kind of core. They're the core essence of um, our things. And when we, um, when there's alignment between our why and our what and our how, then we really kind of have that personal feeling of fulfillment. Another way to think about this is in three kind of categories, right? What are peak experiences? So as you're listening, think about a moment where you really thought, wow, that was a peak experience for me. I felt really engaged or I felt a lot of energy in that moment. So what was happening? What was going on? And what values were you honoring in that, that kind of peak moment? Then you also want to think about the opposite direction. So where were those times where you felt highly uncomfortable or that you didn't feel engaged or that you didn't feel like it, it actually was a good fit, fit for you? So those are suppressed values and then the code of conduct, what's most important to you? And here are some questions. This slide is not only looking at three things, but also some questions that you can, you know, after the workshop today, reflect on a bit more deeply, or you could, you know, with your team, 
um, if you're part of a, a work team or if you're part of a community team, you can actually engage your team members around conversations around these kinds of questions. I, I love this notion of peak experiences and also these kind of negative experiences and then how we react at the combination of those three things. And they actually take us into Simon Sinek's uh, three layers of uh, discovering our why. In the chat box, I've put on the screen uh, some values that we often hear when we're facilitating values conversations with different groups. In the chat box, share some values that uh, speak to you. And I'm gonna try to bring up our chat box and see if people are um, putting values in. So there's communication, someone has put into the chat box, honesty and transparency, support. These are things that for each of us, they might be similar or they might be different. Trust, collaboration, gratitude, kindness, Wow, this is you're coming in fast and furious, getting along, humility and curiosity, authenticity. So there's a ton of things that you know are at the very core of each of us. Integrity, someone's just put in, uh, patience, understanding. Again, you know, this 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 wave of um, things that are really important to each of us as individuals. And some of them we share, some of them are over overlapping across um, those of us on this call. And then some of them are unique to us and to the, to the work that we're doing um, in our communities. So when we discover our core values, I put a link to a really great resource where you can dive a little bit deeper, but the, the person who wrote this resource talks about seven steps that we have to follow. And the first step is to start with a beginner's mindset. And essentially the idea behind that step is to kind of think about, okay, I really need to notice that those peak experiences, I need to notice those things that I don't feel really comfortable about, you know, that, that slide with those three elements. So be really curious about that and see if those patterns uh, show up over and over again. Then you want to create a list of your personal core values, and then you want to chunk your values into related groups. And so are there things about your values, those value words that you um, have brought forward, do they fit into certain categories? Are there ones that fit into kind of your family experiences or your work experiences or are there other categories that come forward for you and are they related to one another so you know uh trust and um honesty how are they connected for you if you have a number of different values that values kind of statements that you've come up with and then highlight the central theme of each of those groups as you start grouping them together and think about if you're theming them together, then what are the core? What are the what ones rise to the top for you? And then, you know, I think the other things that you do is kind of think about, okay, so if this is a core value for me, if I really value integrity, how does it show up for me as an individual? And then how do I see integrity show up for others and in that kind of relational domain? So I think, you know, I love this, that he kind of gives us these seven steps. We would take them and not try to do them all at once, right? So you might start with, you know, uh, you might say, okay, over the next two weeks, I'm going to do a couple of steps, you know, uh, at a time. So the first day you might do the beginner's mind, think about your events, and then, uh, and then start to create your list of personal core values, and then just let it sit there maybe a couple days later, come back to it, reflect on it, and then do the next couple of steps, right? So that's how I approach um, these kinds of activities, because it gives you not only the time to do the work, but also the time to reflect on the work. And I think when we're thinking about our why, we need to have both the time of thinking about the why, but then reflecting on it as well. So um, I'm gonna give you a minute to do that first piece of work. So if you have a piece of paper beside you, um, write down three to five values that are important to you. So I'll give you a minute to do it. So I'm gonna go quiet for a minute. 
So this is your starting point, and then you can move your way through the rest of the steps uh, when you're ready. So the why, our personal why, is really critical. And sometimes we are at a collaborative table or we might be in an organizational context where it feels like it's friction for us, right? And so that's when our kind of core why may not necessarily be aligning with our organizational why or the collaborative why. And so it is really kind of thinking about, okay, so what in this organizational or collaborative context do I have to pay attention to? And so within an organizational or collaborative context, there are explicit things that you can turn to. So what's the vision, the mission, the value statements, particularly in an organizational context, but in a collaborative context, what's the work we're trying to do and what are the agreements we have on how we're working together? And then there are implicit parts of um, organizational wise, right? How we work with one another and some things that are often not spoken. Those behaviors that we both reward and sometimes those behaviors that are not rewarded within either an organizational and, and or collaborative context. And so think about within your own organization, within the collaborative groups you're working with, what are those explicit things that you can turn to and say, how do these align with my why? But also, what are some of those implicit things that either make you really happy and joyful about being engaged or get a little bit under your skin at times? Organizational culture. I came across this as I was preparing. And I thought, oh, this is kind of helpful, you know, to think about um, what makes us us as an organization. I think it's also relevant to collaboratives. So what are the things about commitment, shared purpose, values, mindsets, and behaviors? What are the things around words and the deeds of the leaders that are engaged in this work? And are they the folks that call us or are we the folks that call others if we're playing that leadership role? What's the practice and uh, processes? And are they things that like make us sing or make us go, oh, uh, you know, and we have both of those in most of our organizations and in our collaborative processes. We have things that really make us sing, and then those are us, those things that make us kind of feel a little bit tired. Um, what are the ritual stories and lore um, in our connection to this organization and collaborative? And then what are the relationships? And you know. I've been thinking myself recently a lot about love because someone said you have to love the work that you're doing, right? And I think, you know, there are times where I don't love it very much, but um, how can I get closer and closer to the love? And I think discovering our why brings us closer and closer to the love. So this is just one way of kind of thinking about the culture and then diving into it a little bit further. Here's another way of doing it. it. And I love this. This is a tool that I'm using more and more in workshops that I'm doing. This is the culture design canvas. And while it's made for workplaces, it actually can be adapted to all sorts of different environments, collaborative groups, workplaces, your smaller teams that you're working with, um, partnerships that you're trying to develop in your communities. This canvas is a great way to engage in conversations, right? So if we're trying to build, you know, if we're trying to engage in a deeper understanding of our why from an organizational perspective, what's the purpose? Why do we exist? What are the values that we're bringing to the work that uh, both our individual values and our shared be, uh, shared values. And then you can work your way around the canvas. How does decision making happen? What are meetings like? Uh, what are some of the norms and the rules that you know either enable us or sometimes don't enable us, sometimes take power away from us? I love the behaviors one. Uh, the behaviors um, uh, box here, but it also is one of those things that some people stumble over because it says, what are the behaviors that we reward and what are the behaviors that we punish? And, you know, every time I think about this box, I think about, you know, at Tamarack, we sometimes speak in code, right? So we refer to acronyms within our organization. And we have a new, a bunch of new folks that have just joined us on our team. 
And when we speak in an, in the using acronyms, that's rewarding. Some people have been with us for a long time, but it's punishing some of the folks on our team who are new. And so how do we kind of think about the work that we're doing in different kinds of ways? What's really important right now, and I know Tim, you probably could talk about this a lot more, how are we creating spaces around psychological safety, right? So how, and this is really important when we're dealing with issues in our community where people may or may not be safe or may or not may or may not feel safe, right? So what are the conditions that we can create where that, where they can come into the space around psychological uh, and have that sense of psychological safety and, you know, I'm part of a group in um, Virginia right now, and um, our our training has been online, and uh, they were thinking of moving it to face-to-face -face training. And I said to the group, I said, before we move to face-to-face -face training, let's have a conversation with people about how comfortable they are in coming into shared spaces and what that would look like for them. And so that's a, that's a conversation about creating some of that psychological safety, then feedback and rituals. So this is a great little tool and a resource, and we'll make sure that you have the link to it and invite you to dive into it to kind of get a deeper understanding of both your organizational why, but also your um, collaborative why potentially. So in the chat box, um, and I, I we can't unmute yourselves, unfortunately, but in the chat box, what questions does the culture design canvas raise for you? So maybe uh, as you look back at the culture design canvas, I'll bring it back up. What does it raise for you? What are some things that as you're looking at this, you're thinking, huh, this is interesting, or I could maybe use this in one way or another. And so just put that into the chat box and uh, we'll come back at it. Uh, love to hear your ideas and your feedback. Some of it might be useful to you. Some of it may not necessarily be useful to you, or some of it might be provocative for you and you wanna think about it a little bit more. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, now we're going to just pivot to our third big area of thinking. When we think about both our individual why and how we frame our individual why, and then we think about our organizational collaborative why, it then takes us into thinking about, okay, so how do we show up in these spaces? What is the leadership practice that we need to engage in to not only uh, show up authentically involved with our own why, but then to uh, um, uh, encourage others to show up in similar kinds of ways. And when people are together and their whys are in sync, as we said before, that's when things really sing, right? That's when you know you have that kind of peak experience. There's alignment, there's shared purpose, there's that kind of you know, people feel like, oh, okay, I'm really doing something that I feel passionate about and that I can really move forward. And the other folks in the room also have that kind of synergy and that passion and, and really want to move forward with me. And that's where you see collaborative experiences really um, take flight. So some of the things in, in terms of thinking about us as leaders that we have to pay attention to are these two things that we have seen front and center, particularly during the last uh, 18 months of COVID and all the kind of ups and downs that we've been through over the last number of months and we'll still be facing going forward. And so there are things in the broader environment. There are political shifts that are happening all the time. There are economic shifts that we are facing and that our communities are facing and that other leaders are facing um, that we're engaging with. There are social shifts. If you think about you know, how people are um, talking about their identities and uh, the, the way that we you know, think about equity and inclusion, those things have certainly shifted quite significantly over the last little while. Um, there are shifts in technology and how we connect with one another. There are environmental shifts and there are legal shifts. So things are shifting all the time. And we know that it is a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambigu ambiguous world. And that per, um, 
produces a lot of pressure on all of us as leaders, not only us as convening leaders of these conversations, but if you think about the other people that are collaborating with us, they have all of these same experiences as well. And so they're, they might be showing up as more tired or exhausted or that the demands are um, weighing heavily on their shoulders or because they can't see a stable future in the immediate future, they're worried about things and they're bringing those into the spaces. So it really does challenge us as leaders of this kind of work, of this community change work to not only think about what are the impacts of all of this on me as the leader, but also what are the impacts of this on the folks that are coming into the leadership space with me. So you want to think about, you know, how are you dealing with today and think about the changes that you're leading, the challenges that you're dealing with and and be really purposeful about those and and not only think about them in your own context, but think about them in the context of the others that you're working with. What this means for all of us is that it can't only be a self mindset, right? It's really about the we mindset, the moving from the self to the us to the we and, and looking at the, the impact of how everything is on me as an individual, how it affects the us, our group or our team, and then how it is impacting the communities and the people that we're trying to support or engage in those communities, right? And so it's really moving along our mindsets and looking at these three lenses or these three mindsets. It's a changing paradigm for us. So what we see at Tamarack in terms of dealing with these changing paradigms is this, mo this, this kind of uh, needle moving from competition to collaboration, from reaction to prevention, from experts to really understanding that we're all showing up as citizens and that each of us carries some form of expertise into the room. And then how do we acknowledge that there isn't, expertise doesn't just sit in one, in the realm of one person, but is, you know, all of, all of the shared experiences that we have to become more vision driven and to really think about how we can engage others into a shared decision making process. And this is, you know, this is what this volatile environment is calling for. And you all know this because you're working in communities, but sometimes we, you know, land in the world of it's just easier to do uh, action and activity because it feels like we're moving something forward quickly. Volatility, uncertainty requires us to kind of shift our mindsets a little bit. And we know that when we can shift our mindsets and we discover our why more deeply, it actually helps us get to um, better and more impactful peak experiences. So you want to think about where you're where you are as an individual around these changing conditions, where's your organization, and also where is the community? So are you working in a community context where there might not necessarily be as much collaboration or there might not be as much shared decision making? And how can you as a leader in that context talk about some of this uncertainty, some of this uh, volatility in a way, particularly right now, that is helpful and creates you know, the opportunity for better conversations? Um, again, uh, it's changing mindsets from the I win to the we win, right? That are, are that, that we will benefit when we uh, work together more cohesively and collaboratively and can, can achieve those kinds of changes. And that feels a bit hard right now, particularly because, you know, we have all come through this kind of shared federal election experience where there was much more d d uh, divisiveness and, uh, acrimony. So it might feel that more in our communities, in our organizations, and sometimes even in our families. But when we can find alignment around the whys, um, that kind of purposeful alignment, I think we can create some more of those synergies. So here are some principles of how to maybe work a little bit differently. And we're drawing on the wisdom of some key thought leaders in change. And so this is Simon Sinek. Um, and he says uh, that there are leaders and there are those who lead. 
leaders hold a position of power and or influence and then then there are those who inspire us to lead and simon would say we need to have those folks that inspire us to lead that really do bring that kind of welcoming of voices into um this this kind of new way of thinking that 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 shared that sharedness that shared value the second principle is about working across boundaries and margaret margaret wheatley is someone who has certainly influenced tamarack and our early work at tamarack and so her um looking to her wisdom is that when we seek connection we are res we restore the world to wholeness our seemingly separate lives become meaningful as we discover how truly necessary we are to each other. And so that's that's a, a really important call to action to work across boundaries. Peter Block uh, really talks about change, right? That we have to create the future is to change the nature of the conversations that we're having, to go from blame to ownership, from bargaining to commitment, from problem solving to possibility. And that's all about, you know, leaning into more purposefully the why, the why that we have individually, the why that we have in organizations, and the why that we bring to leadership. In terms of engaging in uh, systems wide thinking and action, Peter Senge's wisdom is that systems thinking is a, dis is a discipline for really seeing the whole rather than the parts, seeing the patterns rather than static uh, snapshots, and for understanding the interconnectedness. And, and I think that this is really interesting, particularly when we're working in the context of community change and we're working with other partners. What's the interconnectedness between us? What's the... What's the um, what's not only happening on the ground, the grassroots, but what's also happening in the grass tops. And then finally, all of this work really calls us to think about courage. Um, and Brené Brown, I don't know if any of you on uh, the call have, uh, have thought about Brené Brown or listened to any of the videos that Brené has out there, but she really does talk about you know, um, the things that we can do that can truly call that courage out of us. And uh, I love this quote from Brene, which is really, vulnerability is our most accurate measure of courage. And, you know, sometimes we don't show up and we don't want to show that vulnerability um, in uh, the community context. And yet, when people do show that vulnerability, you know, we create these um, more authentic connections between people that are willing to show some of that vulnerability to others. And, uh, you know, I think it is one of those things that really is that kind of measure of courage in each of us. And, and I love how this, how Brene's quote really brings to life this principle of um, really being create courageous in our communities. And courage is sometimes being vulnerable and it's also sometimes um, saying things that you know speak truth to power in some ways uh, in the work that we're doing. So these principles for change makers, these principles for all of us on the call as we're engaged in this kind of work of change in community is really um, these five, right? So how do we engage in authentic conversations with others? How do we work across boundaries? What's the things that we can do in a system to really begin to catalyze some of the things that we're hearing, that we're observing, some of those patterns, some of those connections? What's that systems thinking and action? Um, and how can we be courageous? Now, this is a lot. This is a big menu of activities and might seem a bit overwhelming. I would say, you know, if you're interested in this, pick one. Pick one and try to um, embrace it in the work that you're doing, right? So it might be the principle of working across boundaries. It might be the principle of bringing new voices into the conversation. It might be the principle of thinking about, okay, our work is about this, but what does our work in our community, how does our work in our community impact the larger system. So pick one and then figure out uh, some strategic actions that might move that one action or activity forward. Don't try to do them all, 
do one at a time or do one that you're really interested in and then spend some time reflecting on what you saw change as a result of you know embracing that principle or embracing that specific action so here are some things uh and i'm gonna invite you now to think about a question that you might bring forward before i kind of take us into the final couple of slides because we want to leave enough time for reflection so maybe something that struck you in the presentation or a question that you that is sitting with you so here are some things that you can build into your personal practice of really delving into your why or understanding your why a bit more deeply how do we think about things as possibilities as opposed to constraints how do we you know act collaboratively what are the where do we need to bring in and embrace our role as kind of communicators and communicators and I would think about uh, being connectors as well, I know you know. Um, you wouldn't know this about me, but I am I tend to be more introverted than extroverted and so the pandemic and working from home has really played into what I love to do, but it also has made me realize that I have to actually move into the the some of my weaker points which is around communication so how do i do that more naturally and how do i make sure that you know i don't have my head down uh, just looking at my computer but i do kind of make those connections more purposefully as well how can we be assertive without being offensive and a really good way of doing that that i've learned is that uh starting with saying hey i'm noticing this what are you noticing right so it's not um it's not confronting it's actually about hey i'm curious about this or i've noticed this what are you also noticing in our community and then trying to find where those alignments are asking critical questions and then really i was just listening before i came on this uh workshop earlier to um, a quick uh, thing by Seth Godin about making better decisions. And he was interviewing Annie Duke. And I don't know if you know Annie Duke, but she's a poker player. She's a professional poker player. And she's written a book called uh, Thinking in Bets. And um, I find this really interesting because she talks about making small bets before you make big bets. And that's this whole notion of experimentation. And you'll see if you ever, watch people play poker, particularly professional poker players, they will make small bets first, right before they make big bets. And she was saying on this call, um, on this workshop with um, Seth Godin, that there are so many decisions that poker players make and really professional poker players only make bets 50%, 15% of the time, whereas brand new poker players make bets 50% of the time. So they're making decisions all the time. Is this a good decision, a bad decision? Is this something I need to do? You know, and I think often what we do in our work is that we make those big bets, right? We make a decision really quickly and we go into the activity and the action because we feel like that's purposeful and intentional. And so maybe what are the smaller bets? What are the smaller experiments that we can try, that we can reflect on, that we can be kind of purposeful about that then uh, will engage us in kind of learning more things and then making better decisions in the long run. And so that's why I said when I had that list of principles, don't do all of them, pick one, make a small bet, learn something about it, and then, you know, make a better decision in the future. So yeah, it's kind of interesting that this workshop comes on um, uh, online learning course that I did really quickly today. So it really does, you know, all of this work is more inwardly facing work than it is outwardly facing work, but it can be that kind of combination of inward and outward, right? And so it is about mindsets, it's about understanding our why, it's about understanding what are the values, what are the things that really motivate us, that help make us sing, and also some of the things that we might be turning away from. And then how do we how do we dive deeper into that? 
And then how that happens when we align in organizations and in collaboratives, and then how does that work as we go that one circle further, which is community and the work of change that we're doing in community. So those are that's a big amount of content uh, that we've gone through, the kind of journey of me to us to we. Um, Want to now kind of turn to the chat box and see if any of you have questions or reflections that um, that you're bringing forward. Um, so I'm going to just pull up my uh, chat box here. I can see that there have been uh, some uh, reflections that you have uh, come forward. Some folks have shared some resources in the chat box. Um, uh, Gaylene, you talked about uh, you love. I, I'm sure I didn't see it all, but uh, some of you have really said, hey, you love Brene Brown and uh, that you really value the work. I would say go and watch some of her videos because they are excellent and they're very grounding. And so lots of people are um, saying that. Uh, someone uh, noted, Robin, you noted uh, competition uh, to collaboration, that you love this and um, really kind of noted our political culture changes that we're going through right now. And so, yeah, it is, it is this kind of volatile shifts that we're seeing, you know, not only in our communities, but we're also seeing them, you know, in our provinces, in our country. Um, and we're seeing it internationally as well. We're seeing these patterns emerge. And so for those of us that are really engaged in community change work, what is the message behind these things that are shifting so dramatically? Do Is it that people feel like their voices are not being heard? Is it that people feel um, scared about the future or uncertain about the future? And the way that that uncertainty is showing up for them is that they're, you know, um, engaging in protests because the past feels more real for them than the future feels. So we want to kind of delve into what, what are we seeing, hearing and noticing about some of the changes that um, we're seeing in our communities. Um, Deborah, you just said, check out the book by Jean Case called Fearless. Uh, so I, that's another great resource that we have available to us. So thanks for that, um, for that, Deborah. And Jessica, I'm just coming to yours. So Jessica, when it comes to making a shift to a we mindset, what are some of the strategies to do this in communities with a lot of uh, divisiveness? That's such a good question, Jessica. How I might do this is I would say, um, what are the things that we are noticing about this community, right? Um, what are the, and each of us in our own ways, even though we might not agree on things, we're all noticing things that are happening in the community. So you would get people to kind of share what they're noticing and then start to understand what the patterns are, right? That might be one way that you could enter into it. And so it's not about, you know, I'm bringing this perspective. It's really the patterns across the whole group that start to emerge as kind of shared patterns or shared ways of learning. Another thing that you might do, and I this is a great tool that I've been using a lot lately, is rather than jump to the answers, ask people to stay in the question. Um, and so you might say, okay, so, we can see that our community is shifting and there's new things happening. And you know there might be a little bit of things that we don't agree with. What would be the questions that we wanna ask about our community at this time? And it might be, a uh, question might be, well, why are there so many people that are angry? And another person might say, well, why are there people that are still willing to work in community and another person might and so just asking questions and letting everybody in the room ask questions as opposed to going to answers and solutions helps you kind of uncover the the connectedness between those questions i just did this recently where we doing some work around um, digital resilience. And rather than you know go right into, oh, well, here's the structure we wanna take, we asked people to, what were the questions that they were bringing to the question around digital resilience? And we got way more 
uh, richness in just asking questions. And so um, the richness will, you'll uncover the richness if you just ask a whole bunch of questions instead of uh, just going to um, solutions. So Hanka has uh, uh, chimed in here, great uh, bunch of advice. Certainly a timely presentation, lots of anger, frustration, lack of patience and understanding with the challenges of uh, COVID. Absolutely, Frank, there is lots of that frustration, lots of that anger. And so if we're trying to connect our communities more purposefully, we've got to pay attention to that. We can't, we can't whitewash over it. We actually have to lean into it and say, and be curious about it. So being curious about it is asking questions. What's behind it, right? What are people feeling? Are they feeling unsettled? Are they feeling voiceless? Are they feeling like the future isn't apparent to them? And then what can we do? One of the things that, one of the strategies that we've brought on board at Tamarack is when our team feels uncertain about the future, what we say is, hey, what could we do in the next six months that would create some stability for us, right? So we've decided at Tamarack, even though we think, oh, we'd love to go back to face-to-face -to -face workshops, may or may not happen in the next six months, may or may not happen in the next year. So what we did to create some certainty for ourselves is we decided to go to virtual workshops till the end of 2022, right? that was creating some stability. And so you wanna think about what are some stability that we might be able to create in some of the work that we're doing in our communities, in our organizations, just to you know, maybe address some of this uncertainty, some of this kind of lack of focus that we're seeing amongst um, our partners, amongst our family members, you know, because we're, it shows up in our families as well, amongst our work colleagues, et cetera. Here's a question from Charlotte. Uh, what are some activities to start bringing a community committee to focus on figuring out objectives or items, uh, items to work on instead of being an update committee or uh, an update committee on different things? So really you're starting to kind of pivot them from sharing communication and updates with one another to kind of being more purposeful in the action that you want to undertake for your community. And I would say, you know, you could use a question like, what's the change that we want to try to uh, make happen in our community? What's the change that we're envisioning together? And what would that look like for us, right? So we've been meeting for the last little while, you know, we've all been changing. You might even spend a bit of time saying, we've been communicating and updating what has happened as a result of that? And people will say, hey, we've learned a little bit more about each other. Uh, we're a better able to refer people to other services and programs in our community. So do a little bit of that and then say, hey, if we're now going to focus even more on our community, what's a bigger change that we hope for it for our community? What would that look like? What would it feel like? Um, and then what would success look like? So let's say we want to change that our community members are more engaged in um, in something that is going to be helpful to our community. So our community members are more engaged in addressing food security, for example. What then would success look like for us, right? And so it's, it's a series of questions, I think, in terms of doing this. I think it's, it's really spending time with questions um, before you move into those actions, uh, making some of those, you know, doing some of those small bets before you make some of those decisions and, and maybe even prototyping some things, right? So yeah, our community's concerned about food security and housing and access to healthcare and some of the other things, mental health, issues in our community. Okay, so let's pick one of those. The challenges that we sometimes pick too many of them. So let's pick one of those and let's do something. Let's start with something that might be purposeful and small, make that change, and then notice what happened as a result of that change happening. Uh, do I have any suggestions on how to shift mindsets of people who are resistant to change? Because the way that they've, because they're, they say, you know, that's the way that it's always been done. Um, absolutely, you know, it's kind of interesting. I would uh, use the last little while as a kind of 
observation point, right? So you might say, hey, you know, uh, uh, and this might work in some of your communities and it may not work in some of your communities, but I will often ask people, so what happened over the last six months? What were all the changes that you went through personally and how did you navigate them? What were some of the things that you did really well? to navigate those changes, right? And people will say, hey, you know, um, when I've done this with different groups that I've talked to, um, people will say, hey, you know, we had to go virtually and we were able to pivot relatively quickly into virtual, into a virtual environment. So we didn't, you know, it, would, it forced us to move really quickly. And we found out that we had a competency to be able to do that. And we took that in making decisions quicker, right? So we didn't spend a lot of time in big, long meetings like we used to. We're now able to make decisions much quicker. And so you want to kind of look at uh, uh, something that has happened, a peak experience um, from the very beginning of the workshop, a peak experience that helped kind of shift someone's mindset or one of those negative experiences and delve into those as well. And then say, okay, for this peak experience, what was really good about that peak experience? What did you learn? What did you experience? How did you connect to that peak experience? And if it was a bad experience for your community, what happened there? How, what made it really bad? What could we avoid in the future or what might we avoid in the future? So you can use both. And those are really great strategies in terms of shifting mindsets, because all of us are changing all the time. That's the reality, right? And, you know, people, uh, there are those of us um, that think that the past was the best, but we are always adapting and changing and our communities are always adapting and changing. And so part of this is to just recognize that happening and then really thinking about what was, the, what was really good about that or what really frustrated you about that. And then what could we learn from that? How do we shape a new experience in a different kind of way? So sometimes the, the core thing about shifting mindsets is recognizing that we have a mindset, um, but that the mindset is being adapted all the time. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. I hope it's helpful, um, Holly, uh, uh, in terms of the question that you asked. It certainly is the way that I enter into this. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, just like uh, someone, uh, hang on, I just, uh, who brought this forward? Hank said, yeah, sometimes it does feel a little bit like uh, we, they're shelling and all of this stuff coming at us all the time. And, you know, people do hunker down, right? They hunker down because they feel like there's safety in that for them. And so then we've got to understand what those conditions of safety are. Um, for uh, for folks, and then how do we, you know, if if that's the thing that is part of the reason why they are stuck is that they feel like that stuckness creates safety for them. What does that mean? And then how do we understand that? So, man, these are really interesting uh, questions and conversations, and I I love how I can bring some of the content back into your uh, conversation. So. Audrey is saying we need to figure out how to mo motivate people to move forward when changing COVID restrictions have desire have destroyed their desire to vision because so many events have been canceled at the last minute and that there's a lot of spent energy. Yeah, there is. You're absolutely right, uh, Audrey. There is this tiredness that people are feeling, right? There is this tiredness. And so we've got to think about how do we how do we acknowledge that, right? And how do we say, I hear that you're tired and I hear that you're frustrated and um, tell me about that. Tell me a little bit more about that. And also what could we do differently? How can we get beyond that? Because, you know, uh, and, and for some people we will be able to get beyond it, but for some people it might take them a little bit longer, but to also acknowledge that tiredness. Um, Karen says, I say to my community partners regularly that as community needs are identified, it needs to have a community response. Absolutely. That's the we, right? That's the we mindset that you're um, talking to, Karen. No one agency can be responsible for every need that is identified. Again, the we mindset, 
we try to focus on what we can do and not get hung up on the things we cannot do due to restrictions or other challenges. And maybe it's okay to say, we can't do that right now because we've got these other things that we need to do right now, right? And so we will come back to that, but we can't do it right now. You know, um, I'll end with one kind of quick story and then I'm gonna turn it back to Colleen to uh, wrap us up. But, you know, I was working prior to joining Tamarack, I was working on a, a citywide poverty initiative in the city of Hamilton, Ontario, right? And what was really interesting was we were trying to come up with a plan to end poverty in the city of Hamilton. And I was the director of that work for a while. And I would come to our leadership table and I'd say, hey, here's the plan. We've consulted the community and here's the plan. And the leadership table would say, oh, we're not ready for that plan and send me back. And for about 10 months, we would be going back and forth on many iterations of this plan. And what I learned was that poverty is so complex that having kind of a plan and trying to find the perfect plan was definitely not achievable for our community. And so what we did instead, it took us about 10 months to get there. So hopefully this wisdom will be helpful to you. What we did was not call it a plan. We called it our starting point strategies. Right. And so we said in our starting point strategies, we acknowledge that poverty is big and complex, but we're going to start here. Right. And that enabled us to then move to action. And I think, you know, that's that small bet before big bets. Right. The big bet is trying to end poverty in the city of Hamilton. The small bet is we're going to start here. And then our our roundtable said, hey, that we can agree to that. And that's how we move forward. And the community responded to that in a very positive way. And so sometimes we are um, we create our own worst case scenarios by trying to come forward with the perfect plan when, in fact, we know that there isn't a perfect plan. But in fact, these small steps can help us move our community forward. Colleen, I'm going to turn it back over to you for uh, a few uh, minutes to wrap us up. Okay, well, awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. That was a whole lot of great information. And, and I know that this has certainly re-energized myself and, and a really good reminder for us to keep focusing on our why as we all continue to support community engagement efforts across rural Alberta. So um, lots of great um, interaction in the workshop today and we will ensure that you guys get a copy of the recording and, and the information on the presentation. So um, also for other learning opportunities and Holly, if you wanna just throw the link in the chat box, um, we do have another set of workshops for this series as well. We have our monthly information sessions. And so we do invite you to check out our events page on the RPAC website. And I think that is actually it for today. We're ending just on time. So again, I would like to thank everyone for attending and thank you so much for Liz for all of the great information. It was a pleasure to host all of you folks today and I wish you all an amazing rest of your day. Have a wonderful day, everyone.